Ladies and gentlemen, from the Integrated Personnel and Pay System Army Fusion Center and the DAG-1, we have Lieutenant Colonel Timothy Hicken and Lieutenant Colonel Harvey Iglesias. We'll be followed by Major Alberto Molina from the Financial Management School Performance Office. We'll discuss the FM posted state transition. Uh, and then after all three head at our general, uh, see if we have time for discussion. Uh, please join me in welcoming Lieutenant Colonel Hickman and Lieutenant Colonel Iglesias. Good afternoon, I'm uh, Lieutenant Colonel Tim Hickman. This is uh, Lieutenant Colonel Carmen Iglesias. And my boss is uh, Colonel Steve Aden, the SSI Commander. Uh, Carmen's boss is Colonel Greg Johnson at the uh, Functional Management Division in G1. Uh, as I've been scanning the room, I see a lot of different levels of familiarity with PSA. Um, and it's by no means an intention to insult anybody with some of these overview slides, but it is uh, to provide a baseline before I begin to talk about SSI's role uh, in the support of MSA training. And then Carmen is here to talk a high level transition uh, schedule with some military transition lines of effort that are on board. Right, okay. For the first time ever, MSA will provide an HR system that all three components we use. Uh, currently, the Act is one of the third component in National Guard Hall Systems. Um, there are 54 different iterations of SIPRs across the states and territories. If say will essentially place all of those consumers within the next year, and then over the next three years, uh, all three components will be in those. Uh, three main capabilities total force, uh, alluded to that, but it's also been the Army's talent management system for an HR guy like, guy like me. That's an enhanced strength of capability and uh, knowing the formation and being able to put new people. Around. Uh, and then the auditability factor of a system that if it's the role based system, that if I initiate the action, someone else approves the action, and that is audible throughout the duration of the system lifetime. Um, the World Fields National Guard from release two uh, in 2018, and then it is transitioning to field two, the uh, active component and the reserve component in release three, and that is bringing on HR functionality. And that would be 2018-2019, and then in, we did it in 2020, we did it through release four, and then it's in note day. So every action that is initiated in NSA will have an immediate and real-time impact on the school's pay. Uh, within the NSA environment, it's no longer called leave, it's now a request for absence. When the soldier takes a request for absence, there's no longer a TL to, to do the transaction in a separate finance system after the soldier is done. Uh, that action is immediate and their leak balance, sorry, their owner will be known as leak balance is deducted. Uh, I have the privilege of briefing uh, all the classes that come through SSI. Um, and the biggest thing is they don't think that they say they don't know what it looks like. So we show this to show that it actually does exist. This is the, the splash page. Uh, there are YouTube videos on it that were just released that can walk you through how to use the splash page. But if you're familiar with USAA or Wells Fargo, where you click on a pile, you want to know your credit score, you click on the pile. That is the whole mindset behind the design of MSA. It is not being designed for people in this room. It is being designed for the people across the street in AIT. Uh, so there will be some adjustment and cultural shifts for us, but not so much for them, because they're being used by laptops and wireless and high school and all that stuff. So it should be intent is to make the system as intuitive as possible. Uh, some recent in impacts, IFSA has had approval for mobile capability, so the soldier essentially does not have to come to the F1 to initiate a they can initiate a mobile device. Uh, they'll be able to, like UPS, track my package. They'll know that the first sergeant has had the action for two weeks. Uh, so there's uh, transparency added. Uh, it will cut down on some of the workloads in the F1s and create some other workloads for help desks, etc. Uh, but it also associated with the mobile access the ability to uh, use a secondary email. So if you have an action in MSA that needs your attention, it could go to your uh, secondary email address that's important for the other components, but they have something that they need to go and check out inside the MSA. For a new equipment training, this will uh, have a chart that shows the fielding groups for the National Guard. It will roll out by fielding group across different clusters of states. Uh, then it will roll out across the active and the reserve component 
uh, through essentially mobile training teams, and then the system gets turned on uh, big bang for the active and the reserve component. Whereas in the National Guard side of the house, you can turn on clusters of states because we're replacing one iteration of SIP at a time. Uh, so this is essentially some of these shifts based on feeling schedule off tempo of the states. But essentially, you're looking at Pennsylvania as the lead state for at least two, and then beginning with clusters of states that are across the, the country. Uh, for the, like I said, for the active component, the reserve component, this would be one solid color uh, worldwide. So my focus, uh, SSI's focus, is on institutional training, and there are some training capabilities that are being built by the program management office that will be leveraged in institutional training uh, for initial military training, professional military, military education, and then functional courses that we have uh, planned for IPSA. Uh, IPSA has its own training database. It's essentially its own training simulator, and that's the operational side of the house. The IPSA uh, institutional side of the house, uh, we're looking at a four plus size element uh, training database that we can leverage for practical exercises and scenarios uh, for all the classes that will be coming through starting in about 2020 is our transition time for the functional courses, 2019 is our transition time for IMT and PME. Uh, we will be replacing all legacy systems. Um, uh, and Commandant alluded to how hard it is to do some things in trade off. Uh, updating a legacy system POI is no small undertaking. And when a, for an AG person, when you're taking away our major systems and replacing them with the say, and by major systems, I mean EMILCO and, and POPMIS and EDAS, all those systems that, that we use all the time, every lesson that has that system in it, that has the functionality with it say replacing it or subsuming it, has to be updated. Uh, so over the next year, uh, we will be getting access to the IPSA October-ish time frame. From October until about September of the following year is our training development year where we will be replacing all legacy input. Uh, so in 2019, 2020, all 42 out of training uh, will be IPSA. Uh, we propose new functional courses and I'll talk about them in the following slide. For the operational training and the training database that the, that the system has been Incorporated into it that if you were to go uh, on a field exercise, you could switch to the training environment and train on your form of information, slightly, slightly different. Um, but you could do transactions for that training scenario that would not impact the regular production. So you could do a promotion because of the result of the scenario in your field exercise, and you wouldn't be in reality promoting a soldier. But your S1s and your units could get training on that. Uh, instead of using what they do today, um, large uh, inject meals and spreadsheets, and it's the training is only as good as the one enforcement. Uh, Self-development training, all the products that are going to be used in that new equipment training that rolled out across the states and across the other two combos is retained within the system as self-development training. So you've got a new soldier coming on, so you read classes to 42, they're going to be an HR provider, they can take that training, embed it, Training status is embedded in the system so that me in the role of the validator, the person who gives you access to do things in the system, will know whether or not you've completed that training and can be given permission to execute that role within the system. If say functional courses, in the trade off environment, they don't like functional courses. That's a course that you would come TDY to uh, get expertise where the, the team would go somewhere and conduct the training. Uh, we were able to actually push five of them through the trade-off process and they'll begin fielding them out at Y20. Um, the HR community will lose a large amount of expertise when we switch to, you say, of, of just knowledge over the years. Uh, these are intended to uh, go to the mastery level, whereas new equipment training will train the functionality. Institutional training at INC will also train functionality. But if you had like a division strength manager, for instance, and you wanted them to become the expert on how to leverage it, say, you could send them to the data manager's course here at SSI. Or we could take the data manager's course on the road and train it at an installation. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Lieutenant Colonel Iglesias. So, I'm part of the IFSA Milk Gate transition team, and I work 
uh, within the Army G1 with a, a team of about 13 financial managers and HR, and we work integrated uh, as a team on how we're going to develop a say and how we're going to implement it and deploy it on all of the above. So one of our major tasks is no pay transition, and that's about really transferring ownership of no pay from the Army finance community, we've had it for many years now, to Army HR. So we know that if say is going to give some functionality that's going to integrate personnel pay, that HR transaction is going to drive pay immediately. That's a fundamental redesign of the way we do personnel and pay today. And it's also a fundamental redesign for the Army HR community as they're going to have to take on the full no pay responsibility for HR and pay. So when we think about DFAS doing Army's payroll, that is going to transition over to HRC in FY20. So if you see in your W2s, DFAS as your uh, W2 lead on um, FY20 that would be HRC. Um, you use my pay today to do your allotments um, and other sort of financial actions, you're going to use Excel as you can buy Today, you're going to lease form on the or you're going to use Excel. It's going to be an electronic lead form. But that responsibility for personal and pay transfers over to HR community. And so our responsibility on the pay transition side is to build ownership and to build stewardship. So the slides are on here, but what we have is a, a sort of a three-part strategy in terms of training, since our focus um, is training. And we're very interested in making sure that we can transition and transfer of stewardship. You know, we very much care about taking care of soldiers. Um, we very much care about making sure the pay is straight. That is part of our pay support competency. How do we transfer that over to the HR community? Because today, they basically turn it in a packet, and that's pretty much it. They do not follow through. Um, and it's not, a, it's not a dig on them, it's because finance is still there to do the work. So we are having to sort of give them that ownership. You have to take this on because this is going to be your responsibility. In tomorrow's environment, when I have a pay issue, I'm not going to go to Zenco. And I'm not going to go to Army Finance, I'm going to go to Army HR. So we have a three part strategy, and it's um, the institutional level of training. It's home station operational training, and then it's operational FM assistance, so more pay assistance. At the institutional level, it's total force institutional, so it's National Guard, active, uh, and reserves. What is the more pay curriculum at those institutions? So what Lieutenant Colonel Hickman and team are doing in terms of active component is looking through their curriculum, making sure that it has the more pay curriculum inside of it that gives HR professionals that sort of taste of the foundations of no pay. If you have more, what are the entitlements? If you talk to an HR professional today, they could not tell you, some of them can, but most of them cannot tell you what is the driving regulation or policy for entitlements. We know, because we've been doing it, you know, it's the DOD of tomorrow, the GTR, etc. But that's something we need to build for the Army HR. So that LV1 is that institutional curriculum. So that's the Colonel Hickman and team looking through that. And we'll talk a little bit about, in the next couple of slides, about some of their initiatives for the institutional curriculum. It's also the National Guard and Reserve. They're doing the same sort of deep dive and augmentation of their curriculum to add more and more pay. Then there's the home station training, which is we come to you. Because we do not want, what we don't want for the HR community is that we tell them they need to get more training and then they just create their own programs. You know, we worry that they're just not going to get the full foundational, if we just let them do it, what, what we ask them to do without any sort of enforcement. So our LOE2 is, is an operational training program, fundamental course, where we would be forced to you via mobile training team. So it's using the use of income model, sort of going out um, to different installations and providing sort of three-day fundamentals course. So you're going to get the DOD FMR, you're going to get motor entitlements, what are the pay impacts? Timeliness is really important for us. If something is late, you're going to impact the soldier's pay. You may create debt. That is not something that, as we've gone out to our, um, through our pilots and talked to Army HR professionals, that is not something they think about. That's not foremost in their mind right now. But it should be, because once it say comes online, if you take a week or two weeks to put in a leave request or to, to uh, process a leave request, that's going to impact soldiers better. So they need to understand the linkage between timeliness and accuracy. So that is part of the fundamental program. So that's coming to you where you are. Because we know not all of these folks are going to be able to go to SSI and get the little take of So we sort of are going to go to them. And that's sort of a two-year program along with the FM assistance. The FM assistance is that 
partnership, side by side partnership, just like when Pippin and I work together and I'm embedded in the RBG1. It's about finance partnering, finance doing the way today, partnering with their HR counterparts in the field and helping them understand their current duties today. They're supposed to be doing a lot of things. They're supposed to be reviewing KSTs. They're supposed to be making, reviewing your CFRs. They're supposed to be doing, reviewing drops. Reviewing a lot of documentation. There's a lot of information that they have that they can answer. They can answer routine pay inquiries. Just look at so the on this. And maybe you can answer some of those questions there. You don't necessarily have to constantly use it as well. So that FM assistance is about gradually and incrementally giving them the tools that they already have today to own no pay. Because per their FM 1.0, no pay is already there. We just need to enforce that with them. So that program is about that sort of linkage, strengthening that relationship. And I'm glad somebody brought up measures of effectiveness and measures of performance, because metrics is another really important aspect to that uh, effort. And that's about looking at data, looking at timeliness metrics, accuracy metrics. As a detachment commander back in the day, we, we looked a lot into our timeliness. How are we doing timeliness? How are we doing with that? As we are sort of gathering the information on how our HR and finance are doing today, some of our standards have gone down a little bit. And so we are going to we need to increase the standards. We need to get back to the uh, standard of, of timely transactions and accurate transactions, and we need to reduce debt. As we're looking across our community, we find about $92 million worth of sold debt because of the label processing transactions. And that goes back to um, General Holander's sort of stewardship and really the, the using our money the best way we can. So that's part of that, that third effort, the FM assistance. So it's a three part strategy um, institutional curriculum which is the SSI and also the other sort of institutional organizations for the Reserve National Guard. It's the fundamentals course coming to the soldiers, coming to Army HR professionals, and then it's the uh, FM assistance that's side by side, in which we're going to start using metrics again, and start looking at metrics and having them report on um, certain metrics. So my slides are not there, but I'm just going to pause. Does anybody have any questions on the no pay transition side? Yes, two questions. Yes, sir. Hi, there, sir. How are you doing? My name is Rob. My name is Richard. I'm the QA refinement reminder from the school. Yes, sir. And I'm from the old school. So you mentioned that leave is not because of the first collapse. Yes. Are you going to have a guide yes. for the soldiers to let them know that they especially when they go back? Absolutely. So one of the lessons learned from GFAP's implementation, or I did GFAP's implementation in RSL in 2009 was the data dictionary and not having one. So what we've done is there is a data dictionary out available right now, actually, on the ICSA page, ICSA web page, which is already giving you a taste of all the different terms that are going to change once we go towards ICSA. So the request for absence is in there. Um, pay slip may be the new version of LES. Uh, net pay distribution may be the new version of allotments, you know, how you go in there and do allotments. So there's going to be a number of different changes in terms, in terms as we move into the ICSA environment. But the data dictionary is already out there if you're interested in, in just seeing some of the terms and the change in terms. Yes, sir. Okay, okay. Sure, okay. I just, um, let me go. Uh, yeah, you guys, we got to get the this is about the data Yes, sir, you can, you can check with me offline. Okay. Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, so distinguished guests, good afternoon, maybe I'm Melina. I work uh, for Colonel Former at the uh, Edwin School of Pharmacy. Uh, as you can see, for the past uh, several months, uh, FMS has been involved with quite a few strategic uh, initiatives with our uh, commandant. As he explained, can you go to the next slide, please, uh, Dr. Washington? Go to the uh, place map. Just a separate, it's a separate slide. Yeah. Okay, sir. There you go, that one. 
if I can read from on the white chart. Okay, so uh, you can hear from the FSA team, uh, why don't this initiative happen in the determined the SRC from, uh, 14 floor gets uh, close to FSA. From this initiative, uh, we have developed this place map to assess where we at and where we need to be prior to avoiding FSA limitation. Uh, this place map is intended to address those major issues and friction that, uh, that we are facing and more to focus in what we have in front of us, which is readiness. Uh, with this placement, we will have a great opportunity to discuss ideas in order to address those issues that meet that top card. Uh, bottom line is that we, as financial managers, we need to be ready in our FM units to rapidly respond to the foreign mission uh, if we need to go and fight tonight. That's the bottom line. So let's start. What you see on the top left on the chart, highlighted in yellow is number one. Uh, you see some of the friction and gaps that this FSA implementation or the transition of pay support to AG have created. Um, I must say that we, financial managers, have contributed to this uh, friction point as well. Uh, this is due to our identity crisis, as we discussed before. We call ourselves finance, RM, or some, some, you know, holding the culture, or just trying to roll back and pursuing uh, those installation goals. Uh, we continue to struggle about trying to assume a role in the demo installation specific in order to continue to pursue military pay facing forward as our identity instead of focusing on the other for our uh, full confidence. We have not changed our way to do business for several years uh, in just focusing into the mature theater of operations by pulling in place or relieving place high emissions, uh, as we discussed in four points. However, we must maintain readiness in case of war because still in our core competency is our responsibility to execute case of war functions. Uh, but this doesn't mean it's our identity. So when it comes to either finance, finance, uh, we have to go back to the financial manager, like the whole merge. So let's take a look of our core competencies. You can see that there's a green arrow that shows our goal, uh, which is to conduct realistic training of war time mission. It's not once a week, it's all the time. It's an additional group task or additional requirements from higher headquarters. So our mission is more complex than what we think about only basic four going away. From this goal, we go to our five core competencies. So let's start with fund force. Uh, I'm going to apologize right now. We think it's vital that we define each briefly. Uh, and this is straight out of FN 1.06 uh, with some of the major attempts. So funding force, as you know, is a critical capability that matches legal and appropriate sources of funds with thoroughly vetted and validated requirements. Funding force provides flexibility through methods to augment and in some cases lead the effort in obtaining the effects the commander is trying to achieve. If you look from the strategic, operational, and tactical level, funding force is intended to establish conditions favorable to successful, successfully conduct the tactical operation. So, and then we start to see around uh, clockwise, you see banking and dispersing. So, we start with banking. Uh, banking supporters provide, uh, this, uh, excuse me, banking supporters the provision of cash, non cash, e commerce mechanism necessary to support the theater procurement process and the host uh, nation banking infrastructure. Here are some of the major tasks on the banking uh, identify partners agency that can, that can manage. Economic analysis of support of host uh, country, establishing theater army banking policy and procedures, coordinating for that e commerce and supporting technology, uh, helping and maintaining limited depository accounts, those are the FDA, uh, coordinating for that host uh, nation banking capability. And for them, we go right there inside of that four competency of dispersing our support. Is the paying of public funds to entities in which the United States government is indebted? the collection and deposit of money, the safeguarding of public funds, and the documenting, recording, and recording of such transactions. Uh, some of the uh, major tasks in dispersing support is establishing that DSSN, the Dispersing Station Symbol Number, establishing and maintaining theater cash holding authority, providing cash management currency support, providing report, uh, report requirement, providing some uh, procurement support, as you are aware of, uh, the procurement support is part of the you know, CBS or Financial Bank of Services, which is a critical role financial management in place in acquiring, certifying, accounting, and dispersing the funding required for operational funding. 
From there, we move to accounting support and cost management. Accounting support is the accurate and complete report on financial transactions within the Army's financial management information system and the review and reconciliation of these financial transactions to ensure the proper expenditure of entrusted funds in support of unified line of operations, large scale reform operations. And then we move into cost management that collects and lists financial cost data with non financial output and performance data, presenting the information in a way directly related to major mission objectives. We can see in this one here how data analytics is involved in this com in this competency in our FM core, uh, excuse me, in the FM common op operating system, as we call it. And uh, major is doing a little more than that. Uh, management internal controls. Manage, uh, managers and training control program provides reasonable assurance that establish accountability and control procedures to comply with applicable laws and regulations. When you see audit readiness or audit compliance is inside the full competency. If we look into this reasonable assurance as defined, and the way they define it is the level of confidence that the financial statements are non materially misstated, which is expected to obtain from an audit uh, opinion. And finally, pay support. You can see status quo. Uh, we kind of like bring that whole core competency a little bit smaller. Uh, and the reason is uh, the way it's written is we're still responsible for that kind of competency, right? We execute this pay support function, uh, but this pay support slash meal pay doesn't mean that it's already been. So we want to bring that back. It's still, I mean, we still have uh, four full core competencies out there to pursue, which they're only looking always about pay support only. So from this, we move to number three. Uh, we need FM leaders to build this win win relationship with our uh, national providers. Uh, the bottom line up front that we are seeing this is military must maintain readiness and are the one that deploy across the globe. We have to be considered as the only boots on the ground for an early entry operation as part of large scale combat operations. Uh, we don't see uh, our, our national providers up front to see us. We have our FM orders to aim for battle focus training. This is at all levels, from our top leaders all the way out to our detachments. We must create uh, new business processes in order to accomplish this out. Uh, our mind goal is realistic training of our wartime mission. And uh, number four, as you can see, that we have our training cycle. The crawl, walk, and run. As soon as we do this initiative number three, I think like conditions are set uh, and, and takes effect. Operational force SRC 14, more specific, uh, can maintain a high state of readiness training across the board um, by expanding our role at home station and from home station our wartime mission. I'm, I'm using those words very carefully. I'm using at home station and from home station. I'm not stating installation roles. We need to look into the tools we have. Uh, the comment I was playing about the training readiness guide, and you will get a brief tomorrow about the training readiness guide and taking the next step on CATS. Looking into individual and collective mission essential tasks, not calling them technical, tactical, but by calling them our mission, my, our mission essential tasks. We need to integrate ourselves into the fight with the war fight. Uh, end result will be that number five, as you can see on um, bottom right. Combat training centers, water training areas, we, we kind of briefly talk about this. Only any exercises being integrated as a combat training centers. Uh, how we integrate our mission, mission essential tasks into this CTC slash WPA, that's, that's our role. Okay. As you can see on the uh, uh, bottom left, uh, we, we put it there like recommended course of action, but the way we are seeing it, like we are so far, we have seen only three courses of action in here. Uh, one course of action will be status quo, as it is right now. There's nothing wrong. It's a very strong impact, right? In house, OSD, how, how we've been going, how we can get that uh, home and exercise up to Course of action two, training for competency in a limited capacity, way to proceed. Uh, something from FMS, you said FEMCOM, that's another way to look this, trying to bring it to the next level, and ultimately, uh, course of action three, 
which is kind of, that's kind of the name right now, train regardless of admission, allow us to have that active DSSN here at home station focus. Uh, we can see like in the PayCon era, AOR, or uh, the uh, Newcon AOR, we have some active DSSN, we have some contingency DSSNs out there. That means versing roles, active roles, not kind of fictitious, uh, notional, is actually reaching those embassies, reaching those host nations, reaching out, trying to uh, be engaged, integrating FM into that uh, combat training standard. Uh, I know uh, a lot of folks in here, we talk about training like infantry, training like combat engineers and stuff, but they have uh, personnel in those combat training centers uh, and they're helping out as well to achieve that goal. The bottom line is uh, the outcome, as you can see on the uh, bottom right, right tonight, but it is that uh, FM water strength to deploy, fight, and win in a contested multi domain and disconnected environment as part of large scale combat operations. We're ready to fight tonight. At this time, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we will open for questions and discussion.